Buenos días, eh, bienvenidos, eh, bienvenidas a este webinario eh, sobre la herramienta ideal, dónde invertir y cómo crear modelos sensibles al clima para predecir enfermedades infecciosas. Un webinario que hemos organizado en alianza con Welcome Trust. Tenemos con nosotros a Ana Stuart Ibarra, la directora de ciencia del IAI. Marilyn Thompson, la líder de impactos climáticos en Welcome Trust. Bilal Matín, el director senior de tecnología digital y tecnología clínica en Welcome Trust. Y Sadie Ryan, profesora asociada de geografía médica de la Universidad de Florida. Les doy, le doy la palabra a Ana Stewart, directora de ciencia del IAI. Gracias. Gracias, uh, Irene. Thank you for the welcome and thank you to everyone who's here and our fantastic panelists who will be joining us. Um, just very briefly wanted to say on behalf of the IAI, it's been a pleasure to work with the Welcome Trust, uh, with Sadie and other colleagues who formed a part of this team to do this uh, work to identify priorities in the area of tools for climate sensitive infectious diseases. The topic of climate, environment and health has emerged as a priority area across the II member states. And so this is one of a number of initiatives that we have been developing uh, to address the need for urgent solutions uh, for the challenges that, that we face. So with that, I'll pass it over to Madeline and we'll get started with the presentation. We have about a half hour of presentation and then we will open the floor for questions and answers. Madeline? Well, thank you very much, Anna. And um, uh, greetings to all of you from London. Uh, really thrilled to be able to participate in this webinar. And what I would like to do is to give you a little bit of background as to why we engaged IAI in uh, the development and the research behind the report that they're going to present, uh, why it's important for us at Welcome. So if you could put up the first slide, please. Um, the Welcome Trust has been going through a major revision of its um, strategy over uh, the last two years. And uh, the session that we're focused on is very much on climate infectious uh, and infectious disease tools, but it really sits under a broader umbrella. So those of you who are not familiar with the trust, uh, we are a uh, independent, financially and politically independent foundation based in London, UK. We have a, a large endowment and spend at the moment about a billion pounds a year on medical and health uh, research around the world. And uh, for the last 30 years or so, we have had our vision statement has been achieve extraordinary improvements in health by funding the brightest minds. And over the last two years, we've uh, consulted very broadly, um, not only with our grantees, but with other researchers around the world as to what were the priority investments for the coming decades. Mm -hmm. And as a result, our mission has changed to supporting science to solve the urgent health challenges that face everyone. And this has huge implications for the trust in terms of its ambition uh, globally and uh, the way we see research um, supporting decision making in the future and the role of the trust in enabling researchers to not only do the science, but bring their science into society. So um, I'd just like to lay out a little bit how the, uh, we've restructured the organization. So if you can put the next slide, please. Uh, the first thing uh, that uh, we did was Welcome is very well known for uh, its discovery research and its investment in new frontiers of thinking, opportunities for paradigm shifts in our understanding of how the world works, et cetera. And we will continue to fund in that space. Um, so that's going to remain an important uh, area of uh, research funding for us. And in that sense, in that context, the funding absolutely has a health or medical outcome, but the uh, way to achieve that outcome could come through a very broad uh, set of disciplines. On top of that, we have now three challenge areas. Uh, we have one on mental health, which we understand is a very under-resourced area and where new insights uh, are uh, incredibly important, if you like, to um, support uh, mental health uh, going forward. And so we have a long-term strategy there on how to identify new insights, how to shift uh, the field. 
Uh, and then, of course, the Wellcome Trust is very well known for its work on infectious disease. And in fact, we've done a lot of work on COVID response uh, in particular. So that builds on a very core strength. And then we have uh, our climate and health work, which really builds out. Some of you may be familiar with uh, a program called Our Planet, Our Health, which we ran uh, at Wellcome for the last five years. And I had the pleasure of being the interim head of that for 18 months. And there we looked at global environmental drivers of health outcomes. That program is now over. The new climate and health program is much, uh, is very different, in fact, from the Our Planet, Our Health, because it is integrated across the whole of the organization. Um, and it has a long term vision. We just have a new director, Alan Dangle, who started with us last month. So, um, what we have here is our first call, and in fact, it's the first call from Welcome uh, for the whole new strategy. So I'm really quite excited that that new call um, comes from a partnership, not only between the climate and health uh, uh, team that is developing, but with our data for science and health, which is a cross-cutting team that works across Welcome. And uh, you'll be introduced to my colleague, Bilal uh, Martin, uh, later on. So um, uh, I wanted to uh, situate um, the uh, presentation that we're about to hear and the new call in this uh, very uh, broad, new, and I hope very exciting uh, agenda uh, for us all that climate and health is now going to take a very significant um, uh, role uh, at the Wellcome Trust uh, going forward. So we look forward to um, connecting with researchers around the world on this important space, not only through this call, but also um, we have other calls planned in the coming months as part of a set of early investments uh, that the trust is making while we develop a more sophisticated, if you like, and clear strategy uh, for our program uh, going forward. So um, do look out for additional calls uh, that will come in on climate and health around climate impacts of heat, uh, climate um, and heat adaptation, and um, climate mitigation that will be rolled out in the coming months. So with that, I think I will pass you on back to Anna. Great, thank you, Madeline. Uh, so today we'll be sharing our findings and recommendations from a project with the Wellcome Trust to landscape the avail availability of and need for software tools to model the relationship between climate and infectious diseases. We will present as approximately for the next 30 minutes, followed by time for discussion. Our team was composed of a, multi, of a multidisciplinary group of researchers who work at the forefront of climate sensitive infectious diseases. Dr. Sadie Ryan, our technical lead, who is here with us today from the University of Florida. Kat Lippi, also from the University of Florida. Rachel Lowe from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and now the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, Ariel Diaz from Columbia University, and Willie Dunbar from Florida International University. We were also joined by Shruti Grover and Simon Johnson from HEPCO Design. In the following slides, we'll share a brief overview of the aims of the project and our approach. There were three main parts to this project. First, we conducted a systematic review of the literature on climate and infectious diseases to identify existing modeling tools and exemplars. We then interviewed science experts involved in the tool development and policy experts involved in climate and health work to identify opportunities to improve the creation and use of modeling tools. And we'll provide more details in the following slides. Sadie? So to give you sort of the punchline of all of this, uh, the ideal tool we decided needed certain characteristics. And so the characteristics of the tool are that it incorporates both climate inputs and epidemiological information. It produces an output as a prediction or indicator of disease risk, and that's all in the same package. It needed to be transparently described and validated. And then this one is sort of an interesting one that we wanted it to be named. And that was kind of a, a finding from doing the research was that it needed to be named so that there was an opportunity for future searching for that tool and for versioning. So, you know, is it now able to incorporate newer climate inputs? If I want to go back and see if it's been updated, can I? Lastly, that it is accessible, and this is really key. 
Um, and so for that, we simply meant that the code is published or available on a code repository or a web platform or in some other way that is accessible at the get-go. Next slide, please. So this literature review was carried out in two parts. First of all, we did a huge automated scrape um, in which we did 150 searches with different sets of terms run through the PubMed API. Um, HETCO really led the way on doing the computational side of that. And this netted us about 30,000 unique papers from a 10 year span. And so we then used the medical um, subject heading terms to screen for irrelevant papers. And so that allowed us to get down to a short list of 9,500 papers, which is still quite a long list. And then these were, um, we subjected these to a relevancy score. Um, and we chose a top group um, based on this shortlisting to review. And then we, after reviewing quite a lot of papers, we found 242 publications that really mentioned tools and identified tools. And so we looked through that to cut it down a bit further to say, you know, do these match our criteria? Are these duplications of the same tools, even if they have different names in different publications? And among that, we came up with 37 relevant tools. We'll go into that a bit in future slides. Following the literature review, we conducted semi-structured interviews um, with experts around the world, spanning 10 countries, uh, including North America, South America, the Caribbean, Europe, and Asia. Next slide, please. And next slide again. So to go into these primary findings, sort of our key messages here are that there were very few robust evidence-led operationalized tools. The vast majority of those we found were for vector-borne disease systems. And reflecting on how these tools were presented and created, only about a quarter of these were potentially useful for decision makers. And the majority of the tools were made and developed for countries where the conditions are endemic. Next slide, please. So to dive in a bit further on these primary findings, we'll go into a bit more detail. Next slide, please. So as we mentioned, we you know, found these 9,500 publications and boiled these down basically to only 37 fully developed and named tools. And these were represented across 48 papers. So there's sort of this you know, body of evidence around these tools, but we were surprised at how few tools there were. And the majority of these, as we said, were for these vector-borne disease systems. And so, it suggests that although there's a huge literature about climate and infectious disease modeling, very few of those have moved on to sort of the stage of tool development. And so that's a sort of interesting point that we found with this. Next slide, please. So this is where I get to pick on my own self through this research. Um, several of the models that we identified had freely accessible model outputs, but didn't have those code repos or didn't have a way to get hold of the entire pipeline. And one of the interviews uncovered this finding that you know, the people making the models wouldn't necessarily know how to look for a software developer. And so one of our questions back to our, our funder was, um, can we connect those model makers and software developers? Like, how do you meet that challenge? Um, in these two illustrations, I will confess the one on the left is my own work. Um, and so essentially for that, the output is publicly available. The models are well described in the publication, um, but there isn't, and there is an online hosting platform for the gridded outputs, but there isn't a, a proper pipeline for that code repo. And so it falls short of our definition of an ideal tool. And so pushing that forward, um, when it's you know, requested by users, they have to get hold of me. And that's not a perfect tool, right? So they have to ask me to modify the code and rerun it. And so it's, you know, as for people who are non-experts in the programming and software, it's not an ideal form of implementation and they have to look across multiple papers too. Um, next slide, please. And so based on this and, you know, other, other papers we found similar to this, we were, you know, suggesting that targeting some grants to help transition validated models into these publicly available tools would be a key approach. And obviously we have some 
some operations that are incorporating climate inputs and epidemiology, producing the output and the prediction of risk and it's all in one package and are transparently de described and validated, but aren't taking that next step. Next slide, please. So our second set of primary findings was this question about which, which diseases are represented. So the majority of the tools were directed towards vector-borne disease systems. And of these, more than half were developed for malaria. And about 10% of the tools were developed for other kinds of infectious diseases, such as respiratory, foodborne, and waterborne diseases. And so there's this big overrepresentation of vector-borne diseases in the CSID um, tools and CSID is our abbreviation for climate sensitive infectious diseases. Next slide, please. And to sort of dig into this a bit more, these are the pathogens that we targeted in the literature review, having got this you know, list of what these climate sensitive infectious disease pathogens were that matched those key terms that we could search for. And what you can see here is these blue boxes represent those which have tools available. Um, of note, some of the tools were multi-pathogen tools. But so this is where we have tools available and we're highlighting Ebola in red because this has been identified as one of the 10 most likely infectious diseases that can be the next pandemic. Um, and we found a predictive modeling tool, but the code was not quite complete and usable. So it wasn't a complete pipeline that we could pick up. It was also older and therefore had become deprecated and so if anyone wanted to use it, similar to the problem with my work, um, they would have to contact the authors and work with them to tailor the model, which would take a substantial investment of time and money. And so, you know, we can see that there's this sort of predominance of vector-borne diseases within only a small number of tools and a bunch of these that really need to have more development. Next slide, please. So based on this finding, our recommendation is to fund targeted grants for more respiratory, foodborne, and waterborne climate-sensitive infectious diseases to ensure preparedness for future pandemics. Um, there's also a, there's a big need to prioritize non-vector-borne diseases in terms of the metrics that we measure them with. So things like um, disability-adjusted life years and thinking about risk to think about where these burdens are going to increase in the future. So I will now turn this back to Anna for some more of our findings. Great, thanks Sadie. Our third primary finding was that of the 37 tools, only one quarter had legible interfaces that could be potentially use, used or useful to decision makers. A further 8% were deployment ready with detailed guides. And this showed us that the target audience of the remaining tools, which were two thirds of all the tools appear to be other researchers. And so there are obvious limitations in the approach of assessing tools through the lens of a legible interface. But in general, we can conclude that very few studies progress from providing the initial evidence of climate and health linkages to the operationalization of a decision support tool that could inform actions to reduce the burden of disease. To clarify what we mean by operationalization, on the left, you can see what we consider to be a legible interface for the HydraMats tool a hydrology, entomology, and malaria transmission simulator for West Africa. And on the right, you can see a GitHub repository for OMAWA, an R package for malaria warning, which would make little sense to an average decision maker. Interestingly, what surfaced in the interviews was that working on a project which had an implementing organization as a key partner was a completely different playing field. For example, in our experience working in close partnership with the health and climate sectors in Barbados, the tool that our team is working to co-develop has gone much further than tools that we've developed elsewhere, in large part because the local implementing partners have driven the process from determining the disease of interest and the need for a tool to the appropriate timescale of the forecast and the ideal delivery platform for the tool. This partnership has led to new innovations in impact-based forecasting and the communication of risk and uncertainty. So this means that the question of implementation of the tool or the last mile problem really needs to be addressed from the outset. Transitioning research to public health practice must be accounted for from the beginning of the design of the tool through a co-creation process, since the model input and output need to align with decision-making processes identified by public health professionals and other potential end users of the tool. Interestingly, most of the tools that were identified as potentially useful for decision makers were funded by an institutional or country level partner, 
The e-risk mapper by University of Oxford is a bit of an exception. It was developed as a user-friendly Windows package over the past two decades by the University of Oxford and is used by the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. Based on this finding, our recommendation is to fund multi-partnership transdisciplinary grants to ensure that researchers and end users co-create the tools, eliminating this so-called last mile problem. And there's also a need to identify the exemplar public facing partners who are leading the way in the implementation of tools. Our final primary finding was that most tools were developed for and implemented in geographic regions where the infectious disease of interest was, is currently endemic. The tools have been implemented in several WHO regions spanning Africa, the Americas, Europe, Western Pacific, Southeast Asia, and the Eastern Mediterranean, and several tools were global. This suggests the need for tools for regions where the risk of infectious disease transmission is projected to increase substantially under future climate change, or areas where the risk is already increasing, so-called zones of disease emergence. For example, in this study by Dr. Sadie Ryan and colleagues, they projected that under the worst case climate change scenarios, within the next century, nearly a billion people are expected to be threatened with new exposure to viral transmission by both Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus mosquitoes, affecting diseases like dengue fever, Zika, and chikungunya. This means that suitability for some regions will increase while suitability in other regions will decrease. And we are already seeing the emergence of 80s transmitted diseases in temperate latitudes like the southern cone of South America and in higher elevations in the tropical Andes. In 2020, for example, Argentina experienced the worst dengue epidemic on record, but it went largely unnoticed due to the COVID pandemic. Based on this finding, we believe that there is the potential to link countries that are currently experiencing epidemic transmission and have the experience developing and implementing tools to address these threats, I should say epidemic and endemic transmission, to countries that are experiencing the emergence of new disease threats. And we suggest funding projects that can cross pollinate between these different regions, allowing for the dissemination of lessons learned and best practices. And we also identified the need to further explore which regions are the most or least prepared for forecasting infectious diseases under changing climate conditions. Sadie? So in these next few slides, we're going to talk about some secondary findings. Next slide, please. Broadly, these findings are that we need a greater representation of the global south. We need tools at a variety of spatial scales that few of the models were forecasting beyond the seasonal outlook. And that this is a sort of important one that health sectors don't necessarily have a mandate to focus on climate impact on health. And I say yet. Um, next slide, please. We found that there was just a predominance of North American and European institutions represented, with over a third of the institutions associated with the tools we identified represented or were in the US or UK alone. And in some cases, the model was named after a Northern research body rather than the location it was studying or representing. And so, next slide, please. This fun network diagram that um, Simon at HETCO put together with some of our results shows that there's, you know, these, these institutions that are acting as nodes in a network, but that network is somewhat sparse. Um, and so the London School is acting as a bridge between North America and Asia and the Pacific. So we see that um, right there in the middle. Uh, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health was sort of acting as a conduit into Scandinavian institutions. And Africa and South and Central America are underrepresented in this network of the institutions doing most of this work in the literature. But certain institutions are building outreach. And I was pleased to see the University of Florida is one of those. Um, and then there's, you know, a separate network that we can see over on the left just a chunk there, um, with Liverpool University at the center connecting into these other regions. And so, you know, there's sort of a need to maybe connect the network better across all of this and not have predominantly uh, these Northern institutions. Uh, next slide, please. Our next finding was that the spatial scale of the tools in the final list varied considerably 
And that's a good thing to have models at different scales because it helps facilitate decision makers at different granularities. But some of the limitation of this might be that if you've made a model for a very localized area, such as one residential area or a village, it's hard to think about sort of the transferability and the operationalization in other locations while being able to have a well-validated model at that scale. Conversely, these tools with very coarse resolution might be great for large scale planning efforts, but then become limited in their utility to local stakeholders making those on the ground decisions. And so the takeaway really is there's no best scale for models. And so it's important to encourage those models at different scales to help facilitate that decision making at different granularities. Next slide, please. So what we saw was you know, a suite of these scales, but some example of local school tools from our final list include Anispex, SLIM, and Fleetick Risk. And those are at a sort of site or point and very well validated locally, but not as easy to generalize. Whereas some of these uh, ones on the right, as you can see, Mara and the Vibrio Map Viewer and Alba Pictures pack package are at a continental scale which means they're slightly less actionable for local stakeholders. And given the sparsity of pathogen coverage in our list, it's important to sort of fill out all of those boxes in the matrix with tools. Back to Anna. Thanks, Sadie. Climate input data and the temporal scale of the model output was also an important aspect of climate informed models that we need to consider. The majority of studies that we found leveraged gridded climate data as inputs for making model projections, with temperature and precipitation being the most commonly used climate indicators. Most models were developed to forecast disease risk at the seasonal time scale, and this revealed a lack of sub-seasonal and long-term forecasting or prediction tools. And we believe that tools should be developed across a range of time scales to respond to the different decision-making needs of the health sector. Researchers and decision makers agreed that useful tools lack sustainability without being backed by the political will. They also shared that before, uh, that before the political mandate, information sessions on the importance of multi-sectoral dynamic collaboration are key to bring everyone onto the same page and to build those partnerships. Interviewees also shared that in some areas, tools that were available and functional may not become operational due to this lack of a political mandate which may limit uh, long-term allocation of resources and support to mainstream the tool into day-to-day -day operations, for example, in the health sector. And they shared that this is extremely challenging to navigate and perhaps one of the most important aspects would be to uh, use these tools to be able to support this day-to-day -day decision-making or to feed into, for example, national adaptation plans. Many of the experts we spoke to also agreed that political mandates would help to make the operational of the tools possible such that the health sector begins to focus on the impacts of climate on health. And so there is an, it's important that we think about how to create an environment in the political and institutional context that can enable this kind of work and enable tool implementation. I'm gonna hand it over to Bilal now for the last set of slides. Thanks, Anna. Can I get you to jump to the next one? Brilliant. So putting it all together, hopefully everyone can see that there are a number of opportunities where a little bit of money can galvanize or even start a really important conversation. So step one for us at the Wellcome Trust was putting aside 10 million pounds to fund tools that will catalyze the next generation of climate sensitive infectious modeling diseases, disease modeling. And if I get you jump to the next slide. Um, the idea behind the call isn't to fund um, the early warning systems or hypothesis driven research but rather the methodological advances and the software tools, the digital infrastructure that will support the research we know is so necessary. In essence, we're looking to fund the enabling environment through this call. So if you have a good idea, we'd love to hear it. The QR code on the screen will take you straight to the scheme page. And as Madeline said, this is just the beginning. There are a number of other important problems highlighted in the report, and both of our teams will be sharing some really, uh, hopefully exciting announcements in the, next, in the coming months about how we intend to address those problems as well. So watch this space. And Anna, last slide. I'm gonna hand back to the IAI team in a moment, but before I do, I wanna make clear that as much as we want to, there are some things that we just can't discuss. We really wanna make sure there's a level playing field for all applicants, especially those that can join us today. So any questions about the competitiveness of specific ideas or eligibility, we won't be able to comment on. But please do feel free to email us. The email address is up on the screen.
Otherwise, I'm really looking forward to hearing everyone's thoughts. And Irene, back to you. Thank you, Bilal. I was about to finish typing the email in the chat box. <laughs> I didn't get to that. Um, voy a pasar al español, aunque veo unos comentarios en inglés. Sí, eh, tal vez Ana o Bilal nos pueden ayudar a poner el correo electrónico para las consultas en el chat. Sí, muy bien. Veo que se ha despertado muchísimo interés y tenemos mucho tiempo para preguntas. Eh, no sé, Ana, si tú quieres eh, tener la palabra antes de pasar a las preguntas y respuestas. Bueno, quiero abrir con una pregunta general para nuestras, nuestros colegas que están con nosotros. Eh, ¿Cómo ven eh, el rol de este tipo de iniciativa para poder realmente promover soluciones? Digamos, ¿qué, qué, ¿qué es lo que esperan que sea el resultado de esta convocatoria para poder realmente eh, proveer una solución para los países de la región? Anyone can feel free to jump in. So sort of what would sí, you hope? Sí, puede alzar la mano. <laughs> I think Madeline and, and Bilal are debating on who's going to respond. Yeah, Is that right? <laughs> I think you're going to have to help us with an English translation. No, you have to go with the doctor. Oh, <laughs> so you, <laughs> apologies. Yes. For everyone to remember, there is interpretation on the bottom, there are language channels. Uh, I can just say, going to the welcome team, and Sadie also, please jump in from, from your expertise. What would you really hope is sort of the long-term outcome of this call in terms of the impact on health in the region, how this can be of benefit to countries and governments across the region? So that is a great question. And I think this is where we have to see this uh, this piece as part of a broader landscape. So it's not just a one-off call. It's not just a one-off activity. Um, it will be built into a much broader engagement. As I showed you in the opening slides, we have a long-term interest in connecting the climate and health work to the infectious disease uh, challenge area as well. So, and then we have this underlying platform uh, for data for science and health. So this call, if you like, fits that those three areas, and it will absolutely be a long-term uh, area of engagement for the trust, uh, given how it's structured and positioned. I think, like we know, tools by themselves don't do anything. It's people that use tools to, uh, and they use them in a context, and in that context, people have to make decisions, etc. So, what we're starting with here is uh, seeking to um, bring out and strengthen capacity for the development of tools that have the potential to be used. And it means understanding the issues that Anna and Sadie presented in the, um, in the report. Yeah. So it's not just about coding. It's not just about producing a paper around a particular model, et cetera. It's really trying to think through what type of capacity is needed um, for a particular community to be able to engage with decision makers. And we know that we need tools in this space. So we want to foster that environment um, for a longer term vision. But as our strategy is still in development, it's, uh, we're kind of a little bit ahead of ourselves in, the, yeah, in getting this call out there, uh, in part because we want to strengthen the community so that as we build in new calls uh, going forward, there's already an active community working in this space. Uh, Bilal, do you have anything to add to that? Absolutely nothing other than to say, I think the piece that really comes out of um, the report is the lack of co-creation that exists in the community or all the work that's been produced to date. And you can see that the symptom of it being that most of the tools don't have user interfaces that are set up for policymakers and decision makers to take advantage of them. And I'm hoping that that we might encourage a little bit of behavior change to the call by demonstrating that funders really do care about mm. shifting the needle for human health and well-being and outcomes rather than the next interesting paper that would be published or could be published. Um, and yeah, that, that would be my, my hope for what the call achieves. Mm. 
Gracias, Bilal. Tenemos algunas preguntas, alguna, algunas en inglés, algunas en español. Eh, algunas voy a contestar directamente en el chat porque pertenecen al área de la convocatoria en sí, pero nos queremos enfocar más en el reporte, ¿no? Tenemos una pregunta de Adriana Silva. Eh, Bilal and Madeline, are you listening to the English translation now for the questions? ¿Sería posible determinar los factores que incrementan la transmisión de enfermedades a nivel regional y global? lo cual nos permitiría tomar medidas para disminuir el riesgo de más epidemias? Maybe Sadie wants to answer that one. Uh, so One of, one of the pieces of work that um, we have done recently was to apply some of these global models, yes, to thinking about how, how they might be used to discuss where things will be emerging. Um, and how do we think about describing that risk in the emerging region? And for a lot of that, we rely on some of these, you know, future projections of climate change and thinking about sort of how those will play out on the ground and how you you know, meet those with demographic projections. And of course, all of those rely on model outputs. And so, you know, sort of understanding what the reliability of those risk estimates is, is complicated, but that's, you know, that's, that's sort of where we are with a lot of this um, to think about where we might think about future surveillance for things that haven't got there yet. Um, and that's, it's, it's also, you know, on, on the sort of, the flip side, the policy side, not just the how do we do it from a science computer. Um, talking to people about something that's not here yet and thinking about how you, you know, how you link to those decisions people can make about something that's not yet happening is, you know, that, that takes that co-creation, the co-development question all over again. I hope that translated okay. Thanks, Sadie. Uh, we have a question in English this time. You can hear my English? Yes? Good. Sí. The global south is a heterogeneous world. When you say we need to include the global south, are you targeting a special region or group of countries that are considered the global south? Go on. I'll jump in there. I think that Um, at least from the Wellcome Trust perspective, we're trying to be very intentional about not lumping everyone together into what is, you're absolutely right, a very heterogeneous group. Instead, the way that the, the strategy talks about uh, who we want to help, it's those who are most vulnerable to the impacts of the health challenges that we're thinking about. So in this case, infectious diseases and the impacts of climate change. And currently we're talking about the intersection of those two. So When we're thinking about the global south, I would say, who are those communities in what would be considered the global south? So areas in which we commonly see um, outbreaks of malaria or dengue, and where are we forecasting the risk of another disease? But looking at that through the lens of where is their vulnerability to the, to the impacts of these diseases? Where are the health systems not set up to deal with an epidemic or a pandemic illness um, that we need to target our investments at first? I'm not saying it's the only place we should do it, but it's the idea that we need to start somewhere and the best way to decide what regions of the world to focus on are those that are going to feel the impacts hardest. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the framing I would put. It's not the global south. There are regions of, quote unquote, the global north um, that will be severely impacted because we haven't seen these diseases uh, for 100, 200 years. I know I commented on this when I was writing the original blog. I've never treated a case of dengue. I've never treated a case of Zika. I've read about them in textbooks as a physician. Um, but within my lifetime, we could be living in a Europe where these are diseases I now suddenly need to manage um, often and even extreme cases of them. So that, that's the, the kind of lens I would approach that question through. Gracias, Bilal. Tenemos otra pregunta. And Irene, um, I'll jump in and just add that from our perspective in terms of when we were doing the actual review of the literature, 
this really it goes to it echoes what what Bilal said that we really noted there was this big gap between where the tools were being developed and who they were being developed for in quotes and where they were to be implemented. So in most cases, tools were developed for endemic areas, but they were being developed by organizations that clearly sat in the global north in places where these diseases were not endemic. And we are, I mean, I think everyone, people, are, we are generally supportive of, uh, I think partnerships are great, you know, north, south, 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 triangular cooperation, that's all fantastic. But it should, this gap in developing the tools for the implementation I suspect is due in part to this sort of unequal landscape of where the research is being funded and developed and who it's being developed to support. And so that's, I think, part of the goal of shifting that landscape. Gracias, Ana. Tenemos muchas preguntas. Algunas vamos a tratar de contestar ahora, pero otras creo que vamos a guardarlas para contestar en seguimiento a la reunión. Voy a seguir con otra pregunta, esta vez es en inglés. How could the tools proposed be integrated into a national adaptation plan for the public health sector? Could it help forecast climate change impacts on public health? Madeline, you're muted. Apologies. Um, absolutely to that answer that question. Yes. Um, the, um, but I just want to elaborate slightly on where climate um, tools work for infectious disease. And of course, they, it's hard to use a tool, as Sadie said, where you don't have the disease yet. Um, but you might need to engage decision makers because they need to start building it into their long term plans. Another place where it's um, maybe not the right place to, to build a tool, or you need to think very carefully about the types of tools that are necessary. And that's in regions where fundamentally the diseases are highly seasonal and there's such a large amount of immunity in the population, you don't really get epidemic outbreaks. So um, in that context, really understanding the seasonality and the seasonal drivers of health outcomes, how that knowledge can be used and integrated into health systems development and planning um, is important, but you can't assume that um, everywhere in the world is going to respond to a climate event with a major outbreak of a particular disease. So I think you need to understand the local context and also that when we're talking about tools, we're not just talking about forecasting tools. There are many different types of approaches that you can think to building climate into decision-making tools. And it could be about deployment of health staff, um, targeting of, um, uh, specific communities. It could be, um, for instance, um, just understanding the seasonal calendar of interventions, engagement, etc., and how that might vary across a country which has a very complicated climate. And I think of Ethiopia as one of the an exemplar for that. So, you know, think more broadly about how climate influences the outcomes that you care about, and then what types of tools would enable additional knowledge to be brought to bear from the climate and environmental um, community that could improve the health outcome. So I just like to think of it broadly and not just focus on early warning systems. Gracias, Madeleine. Vamos a contestar dos preguntas más en vivo y como les avisé el resto de preguntas las vamos a contestar en seguimiento a la reunión. La penúltima eh, pregunta in English, how do you think that models should be validated in order to be included in a potential publicly available database that will allow to reach consistent answers regarding any infectious disease system? Theoretically, these validations should be experimental and I can see the logistical and economical constraints of actually validating models in a proper experimental way, especially for institutions across the global south. Uh, right, uh, that's, a, that's a really uh, significant challenge. Um, one of the communities that we've been talking to, uh, particularly are those who run the longitudinal population studies, where you get consistent uh, data sets um, being made available in different regions of the world. And that is one opportunity, if you like, to get consistent health data. Um, but we will have a report coming out in one or two weeks a couple of weeks yeah yeah which looks at some of the challenges of integrating longitudinal population study 
health data with climate data. And that is something that we're going to have to consider um, in, in, this, in this process. You've got to be able to integrate what is the type of information and what is the scale that the tool is going to be working at. Is it a local decision-making problem? Is it a national decision-making problem if you're going with the NAPS? Um, so thinking about what's the health data that's relevant? What's the climate data that's relevant? What is the tool that is needed, if you like, to inform the decision-making process? That all becomes part of the package. And I think, um, so it's not such a simple thing uh, that we're asking people to do, but it does, um, uh, respond, I, I hope, to some of the gaps and challenges that we've identified so far. And we don't necessarily expect everybody to solve everything uh, in one go, but to start thinking that through and starting to create some of the solutions uh, to these gaps. Sadie, any thoughts? I'll jump in very validation? quickly and add something, which is uh, we promise you that there is a secret, secret roadmap of activities that we're really excited to announce. And I will say this is one of the things that is already on the agenda. So sometime around uh, May or June, there should be announcements from the Wellcome Trust thinking about um, what's the conceptual framework you need to be able to evaluate early warning systems. And then how do we, how do we implement them in practice, this conceptual framework so that we can begin to build that evidence base so that decision makers have a toolbox of early warning systems they can go to that they know are validated. Sadie, I think you wanted to jump in. Is that is that correct? Uh, I don't I don't need to jump in, but I think I think that's a very important point that um, Danielle has raised about the question of you know sort of what what is validation and what does it look like and is there a way to do that well and consistently? Um, and yeah, I think it is really important to remember that you don't want to wait for an outbreak to happen to say your model predicted it. I have another question, also in English. Could you talk a bit about the impact these models can have in diseases nearing elimination as opposed to having a resurgence or epidemic, especially when funding can dwindle as human cases of certain diseases are greatly reduced? Thank you, yes. So specifically, um, uh, Thinking about, for instance, malaria elimination, which is a, a, a big uh, topic for uh, many countries now, um, following quite substantial investments over time. And uh, the risk, of course, is that the focus on elimination comes at a time when we're starting to focus now on other diseases. And the, uh, in many countries, uh, malaria control has been quite successful. So there's a risk that the funding will go, um, the attention, of uh, the Ministry of Health will change, the staff will change, et cetera. And so there, I think, you, you know, sort of, if you think about a, a framing where you've got underlying vulnerability uh, to a resurgence, you've got, um, which includes both human capital and um, the immune status of the population, et cetera, which will have declined. Um, and then you think of climate drivers and the big climate drivers that will most likely affect in certain countries, not everywhere in the world, will be the big uh, ENSO events, which can drive short term changes, significant changes in temperature and in rainfall. And I think there it's like, well, what's the alert structure that you need and what are the tools that will give you a kind of targeted alert structure? And that is broad scale vulnerability changes, shifts in immunity, and then major climate signals. Now, of course, you might not pick up smaller um, events that are happening, um, but it's getting an understanding of the underlying vulnerability is having increased uh, in the context of elimination. So that when you do get major events, you're likely, um, you need to be able to respond more quickly and in a more targeted way. So vulnerability assessment effectively becomes a really important part of the tool development, maybe, maybe more so than the climate driver context, um, but you still need that, that climate piece is likely to be part of a big triggering uh, process. Thanks, Madeleine. I thought people would take longer to answer. You're so- um, Eden, can I add to that? 
I think just to give an example, exactly what Madeline is saying is what we saw in Ecuador, which had tremendous success in reducing and nearing elimination for malaria. Uh, but as we came close to the finish line, a lot of the funding and support for that effort disappeared. And so that left the, the surveillance systems in a position that was weakened and, and vulnerable to resurgence. And we have seen indeed a resurgence of cases in the last number of years, some of that not just in Ecuador, but regionally also related to a large resurgence in, in Venezuela and effects in neighboring countries um, with displaced people moving across the region also and, and traveling with malaria. We've seen some, a number of imported cases and that triggering local outbreaks. And so, uh, this, these areas where, where near elimination are really are quite vulnerable to this resurgence and climate informed tools can help us to understand the role of climate in, in those efforts and with some work with with Rachel Lowe and her student Isabel, we did some modeling to begin to understand what role climate played versus the interventions, the public health interventions that and so to be able to disentangle the climate effects from from other effects. It's not anywhere near being a tool yet, but certainly shows us the importance of climate information uh, to inform those sorts of settings. Thanks, Anna. So we have time for one last question. I'm going to merge two questions. One is less a question, uh, more a comment about how can we deal in this part of the world with uh, data scarcity we can have the tools but if we don't have the data that's a problem and 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 i think this relates to another question somebody else made is there any preliminary work that needs to be done in say a caribbean country that would like to develop such a tool i'll jump in very quickly and give i think the the, the call specific response but i'm interested in hearing what the subject matter experts on the call think as well um, which is that we're very aware that data scarcity is a huge problem. We have run some other calls to fill gaps. The one that immediately comes to mind is our work with the Lacuna Fund. For this specific call, we've been explicit that we're willing to fund data collection because we know it's, a, it's an important and vital part of the validation process, but also when you're building these tools, having information to play with um, to understand what works and what doesn't is critical as well. Um, so I think we've said up to 30% of the total grant value can be spent on primary data collection. We'd encourage people to take advantage of that. Um, we, we put it in there because we appreciate not every, not everywhere and everybody has the luxury of large amounts of data just sitting there waiting to be analyzed. Thanks, Bilal Sadie. So one, one thing part of our team did um, in are sort of leading up to a lot of the Barbados and Caribbean work was we were commissioned to do a climate health data audit. Um, and so we sat down and thought about what, you know, what kinds of data would you put in this kind of model? And then we trekked out there to ask people who has those data, which, you know, which pieces of what ministry collects these kinds of data? Are they digitized? Are they sitting in, you know, on paper forms in someone's file cabinet? And sort of doing, doing that data audit exercise up front really taught us a lot and it allowed for a lot of communication directly with people who were responsible for data to sort of think about how we can help at all you know tell tell people sort of what what tools we think we want to use to organize data whether or not there was a way to motivate that and part of this question about the mandates from different parts of governance to come together on climate health really that was really sort of catalyzed by that conversation. And I think that sort of helped the digital pathway as well. And so I think that sort of feeds into these kinds of questions and helps deal with the data scarcity issue because it might have been collected, it just might not be available. So I'll pass over to Madeline who also has her hand up. I just really want to reinforce that. Um, I think that's such an important thing because data itself, if you like, provides a mechanism to engage with partners and to start a conversation which may last actually for a long period of time is to understand who's who, engage people directly in a kind of practical way. And that type of engagement will set you up, if you like, for longer term discussions and longer term opportunities. So I really want to re reinforce what Sadie said then. I think that's really important. Gracias. Bueno, queremos invitar a la 
directora de ciencia del EAI, Ana Stuart Ibarra, a dar unas palabras de cierre formal del evento. Como les dije, vamos a compartir las respuestas en seguimiento a la reunión y también queremos compartirles el vínculo a un curso de clima y salud para personal de salud en América Latina y el Caribe. Lo comparto en el chat. Thank you, Irene. First, to express our tremendous thanks to Madeline, Bilal, and Sadie for joining us today and for everybody in the audience for this really fantastic discussion. And I just want to end by indicating that this is part of a broader agenda of work on climate, environment, and health, and a broader sort of network of activities that are ongoing to support the creation of tools and different sorts of solutions for, for the region of the Americas. And one of those activities I wanted to mention is a new course that we are launching. Um, and I will share my screen now if I'm able. A course that's been developed in partnership with the, sorry, one minute. A course on climate and health responders for Latin America. And this has been developed in partnership with Pan American Health Organization and with the Global Consortium of Climate and Health Education. And we will send more information in our follow up email here. I'll put the link in the chat as well. This is a five week course, which is free online, open to anyone. And those who complete the course will receive a certificate from Columbia University. And so this is part of our efforts to increase capacities across the region to be able to address the challenges of climate and health. And part of our other ongoing work has been to identify regional priorities through some, a series of scoping workshops. And those priorities on climate, environment, health are being used to inform an upcoming call for grants, which will be issued by the Belmont Forum in early 2023 on climate, environment, and health. The II is also planning a series of professional development seminars on how to do transdisciplinary science on climate, environment, and health. And so keep your eyes and ears open for those opportunities. And we're just so thrilled to have been able to work with the Wellcome Trust on this initiative and with Sadie Ryan and our other fantastic group of colleagues. So let's please join me in just thanking our participants here. And we will follow up with everybody via email and share the slides in English and Spanish and also the recording of this session. So take care, everyone. Have Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>